All right, we are um, traveling forward in our Better Together series, and this is the last night that we're going to talk about uh, what it means to be better together. And let me give you a thought to open up our, our minds working in this moment. We live in an age where technology that is supposed to connect us does a very good job at the opposite. Let me, let me just give you a, a couple of examples. How many of you have experienced this during dinner, right? And you get that meal together, mom, you worked on it all afternoon, or you ordered it or whatever, and it made it to the table, and everybody's on their own screen. Let me give you a helpful hint for the rest of the year. Dinner tables should be no phone zones, parent included. Amen? But... Maybe you've decided, you know, we're just going to relax and watch some TV at the end of the day. And everybody, how many, put your hands up if you've been here, everybody on their own screen, right? And even the little ones know exactly how this works. I remember when my daughter was two and she saw a magazine on the floor and she went up to it and she tried to swipe the magazine to get to the next and couldn't figure out how to turn the page. It's because this has become our lives I, I just recently bought a new television, and they told me I could control it through my phone, and if I plugged in earphones, I could listen to the TV without the volume being on. Technology is doing a great job at disconnecting us, isn't it? How many of you have experienced this one? I cannot go to sleep without my screen time. And uh, the hangout with the friends. Let's all go out and then look at our screens Man, this has become a little bit of an epidemic in our age where we are supposed to be connecting with each other. We are disconnecting with the real people that we're standing next to so we can spend time with the screen people that are far away. This is leading to all kinds of emotional distress and turmoil. There's a rise in anxiety. There's a rise in depression there's a rise in uh, um, fretfulness and loneliness, all connected to this idea of technology, which is supposed to be making our lives better, but it's doing a really good job at disconnecting us. That's why tonight it's super important that we discuss what it means to be better together. This is not a new problem. This is an old problem that's just showing itself in new ways. And as we've talked over the last few weeks, we've had a conversation about what it means to be better together. And we see that in ancient documents, the Bible, written thousands of years ago, it addresses this very problem that we are facing today. And it draws three pictures, and we've looked at the first two pictures. Picture number one was a tree. Picture number two last week was a body. And picture number three this week is this idea of a rope. And here's kind of the overall theme of tonight's discussion. We are together stronger. When we are together, we are stronger. Now, if I would just take the time to pull out one little thread from this rope and compare the strength of one single thread to many threads that have been tied together and bound together, which one is stronger? This is the picture that is being painted for us in the Old Testament. There's kind of two places we're going to look at. One is Ecclesiastes chapter 4, and one is Acts chapter 2. And both of them have this discussion in them about together we are stronger. One of the really cool things about the book of Ecclesiastes, and if you want to get a head start, we're going to go there in just a minute or two. But you can find Ecclesiastes in the Old Testament. We're going to be in chapter 4. Ecclesiastes is one of the books in the Bible that is considered wisdom literature. In other words, there are several books, Proverbs being one of them, Ecclesiastes being another, Job being another, that's classified as a special kind of literature called wisdom literature. It gives you principles and guidelines for life that are generally true for people in any place, in any time, in any space. Wisdom is like the best superpower you could ever have. And if you are here with us this summer, we're going to spend our summer in a series called Hashtag Wisdom. So I want to plug that for a second. And, and what we learn in Ecclesiastes is, is this principle, that together we're stronger. And so that's going to be the theme of our talk tonight. We're going to see an example of that later in the book of Acts. 
So if you have your Bibles and if you're in Ecclesiastes, we can go there. Ecclesiastes chapter 4. I also have the same words up here on the screen for you. And we'll read them and then jump into our discussion tonight. It says this, two are better than one because they have a good reward for their toil or labor or work. For if they fall, one will lift up his fellow. But woe to him who is alone when he falls and has not another to lift him up. Again, if two lie together, they keep warm. But how can one keep warm alone? And though a man might prevail against one who is alone, two will withstand him. A three-fold cord, a rope, is not quickly broken. Now tonight I want to break out kind of three ideas that come right out of this wisdom literature that was written for us. Written for us by the wisest man who ever lived. And I want to kind of discuss these principles and then as we travel through them, we're going to let you know how we live these out in our group settings here at Branch Life. And all of these principles are good for your own individual life. It's stuff that you can grab onto and you can think about and you can apply to your life, your family, your neighborhood, and your church. But they're also really great principles that we want to apply to our group lives. And we believe that the solution to the problem that's identified in loneliness, the solution to the problem of being individualized is is the church. When God designed the church, he designed us to be living together in community. Church is not going to a place, listening or singing a few songs, hearing a talk, and then leaving. That is something that the church does together. The church is a community of believers. It's people that have come together and are on mission, and they do life together. When you are not a part of a church, you're not missing out on an event that happens once or twice a week. You are missing out on living life in community. It's one of the most powerful things about a church. And it's why it's designed the way it is. And it will last as long as God has asked it to last. So let's look at these principles. Think about them for yourself. And also think about them for uh, a group setting or a church setting. Here's principle number one. And it comes right out of Ecclesiastes. Principle number one, if you have your pamphlets that were handed at the door, you can write this stuff down. We work better together. We work better together because they have good reward for their toil. That's why two are better than one. A few summers back, I was able to travel down to South America with the drummer back here. His name's Tyler. And we were given an assignment at a local camp down in South America to build a rock wall. Not just any rock wall. Don't think about the rock walls that you see people jumping over with horses around here in Chester County. Think about a rock wall that's maybe about seven feet high and as long as a football field. It's one of those rock walls that has a giant gate so the cars and the people can get in and out of it. And this was the rock wall that we were assigned to build. I am not a master builder. I'm not an amazing uh, me- amazingly mechanical person, but they made the system so easy for us. There was cages that were built, and we just had to find rocks and put them in the cages in kind of a way that would enable them to stack on top of each other. And we went down there for a week, Tyler and I, and what we did all day, every day, 10 hours, 12 hours a day, is we moved rocks from the field into the cages, and we tried to build this wall seven feet high and 100 yards long. And I know I'm mis- mixing my metrics, but that's, that's what we did, two of us. We had some help from some teenagers that were on a mission trip, some people that we took down, and we got to the end of week one, and we were not halfway finished. So we said, you know what, let's come back. (laughs) So we made the round trip back to South America for week two, and we were like, we're going to spend this whole second week, we're going to finish this wall. We're going to get it done, and we're going to work hard, and we've got a system now. and, And so for the next week, the two of us labored together, building this wall. We got to Sunday morning early, and there was the final corner of the wall that we were building. And for two people, it was probably going to be another 10 hours of work, something along those lines. But 
we were determined, like, we're going to crush this thing. We're going to get this done. We're not flying out of here until it's over. And so we got out there, and we went to church on property in the morning and in our work clothes and went right back out to the law. We, we're flying out at, like, 2 in the afternoon. We're like, we got to get this done, and we're getting this done. We're, we're trying to put all this stuff together, and we're working together, and it's just not going to get finished. And we knew it was not going to get finished. And I was starting to get discouraged. I'm like, we're going to leave, and it's not going to be done, and it's going to be sad. And I had one of those moments, I don't know if you've ever had one of these moments, where kind of the whole world just kind of went into slow motion. And you heard music kind of coming from the clouds, chariots of fire, you know. Dun, 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 dun. And I looked up, and coming across the field was probably 15 teenagers and their leader. And they had heard that we wanted to finish the wall before the afternoon. And these 15 teenagers and their leaders came out in their work clothes and their gloves and their safety glasses. And they're coming across the field. And I was like, no. Literally, I start crying at the rock wall. I'm like, I can't believe they're coming out to help us. And they're out to finish the wall. And 15 people got the project done in less than 30 minutes. And we were able to finish the wall. Before we left, because two are better than one, because they have greater return for their labor, for their work. We work better together, and you've experienced this somehow in your own life, in your own way. But when we work, when we labor, when we try to accomplish a task, it's better to have someone to help you accomplish that task. You get better return for your labor. So, church... What is the thing we are supposed to be working towards? What's the labor that we're supposed to be combining together to do and investing our lives and our energy? What should the church be about? And again, let me say, it's not about putting on an event. But the Bible gives us a very clear assignment. And it's an assignment that takes work. It's an assignment that takes labor, and it's an assignment that takes effort. Let me dispel another myth. If you're coming to church just to relax, you've missed the point. There's work that needs to be done because we are the arms and feet of Christ. God says to the church, he says this, he says, you are the light of the world. Let's, let's have one more object lesson, and we're going to go through this exercise tonight because I want this to sit in your brain for more than five minutes. And if I don't do something to make it stick, then I'll forget it. So this is how I would remember it, so let's see if we can help us all remember it. I need you to pull out your phone. Some of you are um, following along online, and if you don't know about that, you can go to our website, follow along online. The address there is on the What's Next card. So some of you already have this out. But grab your phone. Now, don't turn on your light, but get ready to turn on your flashlight light. Can we dim the house lights for a second? After the fall, when sin entered the world, the Bible tells us that humanity had a problem. And it was a problem that we weren't going to be able to fix for ourselves. Darkness had covered the earth. And God says, let there be light. And he established that his chosen people, those that came to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, whether to come or had come, would become the light of the world. And that light would solve the problem of darkness. It's the work that we're supposed to be about as believers. So the moment that you accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, a light went on. But what is more powerful and what is better than one light standing out there by itself? Two lights. Three. Four. Go ahead and turn them on and hold them up. What is the mission, what is the work that the church is supposed to be about? You are the light of the world. This is not something you're supposed to do by yourself. Because two are better than one. And when we combine our light, we shine brighter into the darkness, solving this problem of sin. Amen? Let's have the lights come back up.
Let me show you this, that, this idea that God brought to, uh, brought to us when he was here on earth. Jesus said this, and he was doing his earthly ministry. And after this, the Lord, Jesus Christ, appointed 72 others, and he sent them out ahead of him, two by two, into every town and to every place where he himself was about to go. Jesus was going to himself go, and before he got there, he sent his disciples out in two by two. They went out in teams of two, because two are better than one. And he said to them, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. There are many people out there who are ready to receive the good news of the gospel. The harvest is plentiful. There are people that are living in darkness that are just waiting for the light. The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. The lights are few. There aren't a lot of lights going out into this harvest. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send laborers, to send laborers, workers into the harvest. Church, we're supposed to be about the business of working to save the souls of the people around us. You are the light of the world, and two are better than one. In our branch groups, they are designed to work together. Branch groups are designed to labor together in this business of Lighting the world. When you're together in your branch group, you will be together with a team of people who will pray with you, who will talk with you, who will have your back, who will go with you when you're ready to have a conversation with somebody about the Lord Jesus Christ. It will be a place that you can invite friends, family members, and neighbors to come to, to hear about the gospel, knowing that they will be loved, and knowing that your group will be on mission. They will be the team that will have your back when you are on the playing field of harvesting. Maybe one of the reasons you haven't been able to personally see other people in your life come to Christ recently is because you're going about this alone. Maybe the reason you haven't been able to see more fruit, more people come to Christ, is because you've been trying to do it by yourself. And I want to tell you tonight, if you don't walk away with anything else, walk away with this. Two are better than one because they have greater return for their labor. Partner up. Partner up. Grab people that will pray with you, keep you accountable, walk with you, support you. Grab people that will be able to have a conversation in ways that you're not able to have conversations. Grab people that have, are in different life stages and different, different paths and journeys so that they can make connections that you might not be able to make. And grab people that you can pray for, you can hold accountable, and you can have their back. And together, go light the world. And our groups are in different Uh, geographical places, they're in different life stages, and all of our groups act as lights coming together so that we can shine out. And it would make perfect sense that wherever we have a group, we would start to see more and more people coming to Christ. We'd have to fill the hot tub baptismal pool more often, and you would get to stand next to somebody who said, I'm in, I'm a follower of Lord Jesus. Wouldn't it be awesome in one of those baptisms, if it wasn't just one person standing behind that friend, but if that person getting baptized says, you know what, I didn't have one person to thank, I had a group. And there's this Douglasville group who loved me and served me and talked to me and welcomed me, and I decided to become a follower of Jesus because of them. So they are standing with me the day I get baptized. Wouldn't that be amazing? Two are better than one because we have better return for our toil. That's something that our our branch groups will emphasize. So do you want to be a part of that? Then join a group. The the second thing that we learn in Ecclesiastes is simply this. We help better together. We help better together. Woe to him who is alone when he falls and has not another to lift him up. I automatically think of the old lady with the thing on her thing. I fall and I can't get up, right? Did I just age myself? People are like, we have phones now. I was in my attic, and my attic is my old attic, and it was built kind of funny. It had the two-by-fours but didn't have the flooring, and so if you stepped off the two-by-fours, it was just a drywall of the thing below it. And I decided that there was this old cast-iron miniature oven that was in my attic when I moved in there, and I'm like, I'm going to get this out and scrap it and get some extra money. 
The problem is I had to carry it from one side of the attic to the other, only standing on two by fours. And yes, I could have got boards and planks and made a walkway, but now why bother? And so I pick up this heavy cast iron 100 pound thing and I'm walking on the two boards and keeping my balance. You know exactly what happened, right? And all of a sudden my one foot slips off of the two by four onto the drywall. We had a babysitter who was in the garage at that moment and all of a sudden saw a foot come through. And I, along with this cast iron thing, come crashing to the attic floor. Thankfully, the two by fours held, and there was this loud noise, and thump, 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 I hear people running, and, and my family came up to the attic, and after they got done laughing, they asked me if I was okay. And I was rolling around in pain. I'm one of those, one of those kind of weak pain tolerance people in that when something hurts, I feel like I'm going to throw up. And I'm in that moment, and I'm like, I'm dying, and, and they're like, no, and they sit me up and get the cloth and pat me on the back and take me to the emergency room, and yes, nothing was wrong, but they went, let's just make sure, and, and they were there, but if they weren't there, guess, well, guess what would still be hanging through the garage ceiling? My foot. I've been there all by myself. This is the picture that our wise friends paint for us. And... We are better together because we help better. We help better. And again, this is not a new concept. And Jesus talks about this very thing when he talks about the parable of the Good Samaritan. We won't read it together tonight, but if you look at Luke chapter 10, Jesus tells a story of a man who was traveling down a road and he got robbed. He got robbed, he got beaten and everything, all of his clothes, all his possessions, everything that he had was taken from him and he was left for dead. The stranger on the road could not help himself. And while, uh, while lying there bleeding out, the stranger saw several people walk past him. Religious people, spiritual people saw this person on the ground. And some looked, some didn't pay any attention, and they just kept going on their merry way. When this other non-religious, non-related person walked by, he came and he saw the man on the ground and he had compassion on him and he cared for him and he picked him up and he put him on his donkey and he had him travel to the nearest hotel. He paid for his care, he paid for his stay and if he said to the owner of the shop, I, if it wasn't enough, I'm going to come back and I'll pay the rest later. And the moral of the story and the reason why Jesus tells it is he says to his disciples, church, Go and do likewise. Go and do likewise. You are supposed to be the one who helps others. We help better together. And again, I just simply want to point to the groups and use this as an illustration. A lot of times we get so focused on ourselves and our own lives and our own worries and our own concerns that we don't even see the needs of other people out there. But in branch groups, we help each other. In branch groups, we care for one another. And when you're in a group, you're going to be surrounded by people who, when you walk in, they're going to know if you're having a bad week. They're going to know if you're having a good week. And they're going to be able to rally around you and come beside you and say, hey, we're doing life together and you're having a weak moment, you're having a hard moment, you're having a hurting moment, and we, the family, are here for you. And we help one another. It's one of the most powerful things about the church is that we're able to be there for each other as we do life together. Life is hard. Life has very difficult moments. Life has very low moments, and that that's what the church is here for. And some of the hardest things I've ever traveled through have not been my own hurts, but they've been the hurts of people in my church. And I have walked down the road with them in their pain, but together the, the load was lighter. The Bible talks about three specific ways you will probably help someone if you participate in this theology of helping others the way God tells us to. And somewhere in Thessalonians, um, I think in the last chapter of 1 Thessalonians, he gives some final instructions and he says to them uh, three final instructions about how to help each other. And if I can kind of give you some word pictures again to keep this in your brain. He first says, encourage the faint-hearted. Encourage the faint-hearted. So, so picture a friend who's just kind of discouraged or just a little faint-hearted, a little tired, a little weary, and they're walking down the, the, the trail of life, and you come beside them, and you put their arm around them, and you say, hey, buddy, I'm here with you. 
We're going to keep taking steps together. And that picture of encouragement is I have my arm around my brother who's kind of a little bit faint-hearted, and we're going to walk together like this until he's strong again. And then when I need it, when I'm faint-hearted, he's going to put his arm around me, and we're going to walk together. That's what is provided in, in groups when you are faint of heart. The second picture that it says is warn the idol. And this is a completely different picture than put my arm around and say, hey, come on, buddy, I love you, let's do this together. This is a picture of somebody who is stopped, and he's not going the way God wants him to go, and he's in trouble, and you're supposed to come behind him and push him and say, listen, you have to move. It's kind of this idea that the person's standing in the highway, and the semi-truck is coming down, and they're just, for whatever reason, stuck, and you come up behind them and say, hey, there's a truck coming, get out of there. And you push them out of the way. Sometimes when you're in a group, there are people that you're going to have to warn, that you're going to have to, to, in a good way, shout at, that you're going to have to come behind and move because they're not able to move on their own. And the third thing that this says about encouraging one another is, is to hold up or to help the hurting. And you've all been in that moment where you were in such a deep, dark, hard place that you didn't even feel like you could stand. And your legs were useless, and there was, there was no desire to take any kind of step forward, and, and life just hurt. Maybe it was grief, maybe it was pain, maybe it was uh, emotional distress, maybe it was addiction of some kind. There's all kinds of things that cause us to be hurt and cause us to kind of fall into despair. And the Bible says in those moments, you need to come up to that person and you grab them by the shoulders and you hold them up when they can't hold themselves up. And you hold them and you give them the strength that they do not have in that moment. When you're in a group, you will be surrounded by people who will be able to hold you up when you can't stand on your own. And when they can't stand, you will be able to hold them up because we are better together we help better together. So a big emphasis in our group is also going to be this idea of caring for each other. Caring for each other. Now third and last. We serve better together. We serve better together. And look in Ecclesiastes, and this is, this is kind of a, a nuance, and so I wanted to make sure that you saw where it come from. If two lie together, they keep warm. But how can one keep warm alone? This idea of being better together, we serve together, is there is a need that somebody had. And in this case, the need was warmth. And so the solution of the need for warmth was body heat activated. And two came together, and now they kept warm. But if you were by yourself, how could you keep warm? And when we see needs in other people's lives, two are better than one. And we are able to now serve and to meet those needs, to come alongside people who have these needs. And again, this is something that Jesus himself talked about. And when he designed the church, he designed the church to be a need-meeting factory. It's something that we're supposed to be about. Now I'm going to say three phrases, and you're going to repeat them back to me tonight. Let me give you the three phrases. And this is a picture of the church. Good deeds lead to good favor that leads to good news. Good deeds, good favor, good news. Say that back with me. Good deeds, good favor, good news. Now let me explain. In Acts chapter 2 and verse 42, the church had just begun. The church was getting together and they were having... They were having uh, regular connections with one another. They were having teaching times where they listened to the apostles. They were having worship times. They were having times where they ate together. And the church had just been established and it had just started. And the Bible tells us that in this moment there was over 3,000 people that had come to be a part of the church. And so what were those 3,000 people doing? They were doing what God designed the church to do. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing, distributing the proceeds to, what's this word? All. It doesn't say each other, does it? It says all. 
as any had need. The church, as they listened to the teaching, as they fellowshiped with one another, as they grew spiritually, were, was meant to be about meeting the needs of others. We serve better together. You see, this is good deeds. And the church became known in their region as people who cared, as people who served, as people who were selfless. They sold their possessions to help somebody else out. And as they served, they gained good favor. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with, what's our word again? All the people. All the people. Everybody they came in contact, they gained favor with because they met needs. I know of a church that existed somewhere in this country that decided they didn't like it when the community fireworks festival was next to their property. Too many people used their parking lot that night. And it wasn't a parking lot for the community. It was a parking lot for the church. And so you know what the solution was? Let's put up a fence so that nobody can use our church parking lot but us. Do you think they were thought highly of by their neighbors? No. We need to be a church that was designed to share our stuff. The Bible tells me to share my stuff. This might even be better said to share my life. The Bible tells me that as a believer, what's mine comes from the Lord, and I am just a steward of it, and I'm supposed to be generous with my stuff and share, not just with my favorite people, not just with my group, but with everybody who has need. And so when our local community police force says we need money for a dog, we're going to do what we can to help them get money for a dog, not because they're a part of our church, but because they're our neighbor. And it's something that we need to be about. I can share my stuff individually. I can share my stuff as a group, and I can share my stuff as a church. We need to have an outward focus when it comes to serving, because together we can do more. We as a church can now make a difference in the Pottstown area. We as a church, now that we're forming and now that we have more numbers, can group together and race out to meet needs as we see them in various places and in various ways. And that good favor leads to this great news. And I need you to see this. Why did God design us to be a need-meeting factory? Because the Lord added to their number, the church, day by day, those who were being saved. And it wasn't just one, two, or three in this verse. It was thousands that came to Christ. As they had did good deeds, gained good favor, they were able to spread the good news. And the more people that God brings to his church, the more we are able to do better together. So in our branch groups, we serve. In our grant branch groups, we serve others. And one of the major focuses of our branch groups is that the groups are going to take time out of their regular schedule so that they can be a service. It's going to be a regular mandated thing. You are in a group, you must serve. And they're going to serve in ways that are specifically unique to your group, in ways that we might not even be able to do as a whole church. But you bring relationships to your group, you bring needs, you bring opportunity, and as a group, you will come together and go meet those needs. And in some, some ways, and sometimes, you're going to say, you know what, this is too much for just our group. In those moments, we'll say, hey, church, there's this big need over here that the Birdsboro group is trying to meet. And if you can help them, help them. And we'll be able to run out and serve together. And we'll find opportunities where we'll be all in. It'll be a big deal. And we'll find opportunities where it's just going to take a moment or two. And it'll be a little deal. But it's going to make a difference in somebody's life. So how do groups do all this stuff? How do they reach? How do they have time to care for each other? And how do they have time to serve? We want to encourage you to say, hey, our group is going to do something every week. And maybe one week we'll do a Bible study together, we'll pray, we'll talk about each other's needs. But maybe the next week we have a service project. Maybe the next week we have a kind of a celebration because it's so-and-so's birthday. And maybe that next week we get together and we do another Bible study. And that's all okay. That's something that we want our groups to be about as you do life together, to do life in different ways and in different times and in different seasons.
but our groups are the way that we live out this truth that we are better together. Together we are stronger. A threefold, a threefold cord is not quickly broken. And so God in this moment and in, in this wisdom literature gives you a picture of a rope. And maybe you're here today and you're not yet a part of this church or any church. I want to point to this picture and I want to invite you to join in, to become a part of this, to become a part of doing life together. And in just a couple moments, we're going to take some time and we're going to go through some options of how you can respond to this. And we're going to invite all of you to respond. So if you don't have your what's next card, grab it because I'm going to ask you to use it in just a moment. But we, wanna, we want to allow the Holy Spirit to speak to each and every one of us here and ask us, God, what do I do with this? What do I do with this, this truth where you say we, are, we work better together, we care better together, we help better together, we serve better together? How do I do this? How do I do this individually? God, where are there people in my life that I need to uh, work with, that I need to care for, that I need to serve? How can I be better just as a, a single light to be going about what it is you have for me to do? And maybe you're going to ask yourself a different question. How can, where can I team up? Where can I get in and get involved and, and, and connect myself to doing this together in this church? So if you have that card, here's the question that I, I want to encourage you to ask yourself tonight. What steps will you take to be better together? What steps will you take to be get better together? I want to invite the worship team to come up. In just a moment, we're going to sing a song. But between now and that time that we sing a song, I want to ask you to actively pursue writing down a specific action step that you're going to take. It's great. It's great to come together and listen to this stuff and open God's word and talk about it. But the danger is that we can shut our Bibles or we can walk out this place and we can kind of forget anything that happened. In this moment, I want to ask that you listen to the Holy Spirit as he applies the truth of God's word to your life now. And think of something specific that you can do or that you can pray or that you can get rid of that would help you be better together. And let me just kind of remind you as you think about this thought tonight, what we've talked about over the last three weeks. We had a conversation together on week number one that said the tree is better together. And in this conversation, it's simply this truth. We as people, as humans, are better together with Christ. I am the vine, you are the branches. Apart from me, you can do nothing. And you are better with Christ in your life. And if you're here tonight and you haven't accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, you're one of those people that's in darkness. You're one of those people that, that has a sin problem that cannot be solved in your own power. And I want to invite you tonight into a personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Simply, in this quietness of the moment, tell God that you know you're a sinner and you're sorry for your sin. Tell him you believe that Jesus died on the cross and rose again from the dead. And that you want to become a follower of Jesus. You want to accept the free gift of salvation. You can do that in the quietness of this moment. And if you do do that, if that is something that you do in the time that we pray, I'll lead you in that moment. We'd love for you to indicate it on the card. So we know that that's a decision that you've made as a result of our Better Together series. Even if you're not sure. Even if you don't know for sure if you are connected to Christ. If you pray and receive the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, you can forever know that you're a child of God and you're better together with Christ. The second thing that we talked about in our series last week was that the body is better together. And this is directed towards those who do believe. Brothers and sisters in Christ, we are better together with the church and with each other. We are stronger together and we all have a part to play. What is your gift and what parts are you playing? Are you ready to get involved? Are you ready to get connected? Are you ready to say, I'm in? I'm not just going to check it out. I'm not just going to see how it goes. But I want to invest into God's church. And I want to do it here at Branch Life. If that's you, I want to give you a specific action step. And that's sign up for pizza at the past, with the pastor. Sign up for next week's meal and come together and just hear what we're all about. Ask questions and see what our vision is for the future. And in that time, you'll be given kind of next steps and options about how you can get involved. If you're ready to serve, if you're ready to learn more about groups, if you're ready to become a team member here at Branch Life, then just write the word pizza on your card and we'll, we'll sign you up for it. And even if you can't eat pizza like me, I'm on a no carbs diet. 
I'm still going to be there, and there's going to be salad, and that's what I'm going to eat, and I'm already sad about it. So don't just say I'm not going to eat pizza. And why do I say all that? Someone told me last time I'm not eating pizza. It's not about the pizza. It's about the connection. So come and connect with Branch Life by signing up for pizza with the pastors and see what's next for you. Even if you're just praying about it, come and hear and talk. The last thing that we talked about tonight was the road. And this is something that's open to everybody. We want people to come together because together we are better. Together we are stronger. And no matter where you are in your spiritual journey, you can still join in. You can still connect yourself and we can care for you. We can serve together with you and we can work together as you are on the spiritual journey. And for those of you that are in and you're like, you know what, I know where I stand with God. I know where I stand with the church. I just need to be better at doing life together. Maybe you need to get more connected and a group would be the next step for you. Saying, hey, I need, I need to connect with myself here. And we don't, we don't have groups everywhere, but the plan is to always be growing more groups. And so right now there's options of where you can be involved and we wanna encourage you to look at those. There's a Birdsboro, there's a young adult group, a Douglasville group, an East Vincent group. And there's more that are on the way. We're talking about a Coventry group that's very near to this church. We're talking about a group up at Collegeville. We're talking about thinking about groups for moms, for young moms during the day. We, we're open to all kinds of ideas. And maybe you're saying, you know what, I need to start a group. I need to, I need to learn how to do that. I wanna, I wanna invest in a group that, that helps this certain category of people or helps this generation. And, and our groups are designed to work together, to care together, and to serve together. And so we want you to come in and be stronger. And we guarantee, guarantee that it'll help you in your own personal growth in Christ as you help other people grow in their own personal relationship with Christ. So check it out on the kiosk. Write groups on your card. Come to the pizza night to hear more about it. And, and you too can get connected as we connect stronger. Maybe you just haven't had a strong connection to a church in a while. Become a team member. Call this your home church. And we'll be better together. Can I lead you in a time of prayer? Dear God, Heavenly Father, as we've talked about this series, when we think about the tree and the body and the rope, we hear these truths that we're better together with Christ. We're better together as brothers and sisters of the church. And we are better together in our community. We can do more together than we can do alone. And God, I pray that 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 would be true of Branch Life, that we would always be a church that strengthens our connection with Christ. We'd always be a church that cares for one another, and we would always be a church that serves our community as a good neighbor in every way we possibly can be. And God, as we think about how to live this out, and we talk about groups, Lord, we pray that that would make sense. And God, we pray that you would, your Holy Spirit would lead in each and every person's hearts right here, right now, about how they can, how they can take action steps in this, in their own individual lives and in their lives as, as a church, as a part of this church. So Lord, as, as we think and as we pray, we pray, God, that you would speak to us even now. With every head bowed, every head bowed, and every eye closed, unless you're writing on your card, you're certainly welcome to do that. If you're here tonight and you're not sure if you're a follower of Jesus, but you want to make sure, you're not sure if you're saved, but you want to make sure you're saved, I'm gonna I'm gonna lead a prayer that you can pray quietly in this moment. And and if that's you and you want to do that, just just in the quiet of this moment, have this conversation with God, Lord. I'm not sure if I'm saved, but I want to be sure. I know I'm a sinner sorry for my sins. Please forgive me. Thank you for sending Jesus to die for me. I believe he rose again from the dead. And Lord, I want to invite you into my life. I want to ask you to save me and become a child of God. If that's you tonight and you prayed that prayer, no more doubt, no more, no more, no more concern about the future. The Bible says that those that believe in the name of Jesus Christ will be saved. If you have your card in front of you, would you just mark that in your card? I I chose to become a follower of Jesus. Maybe you are saved and you haven't been baptized. Maybe that's what you need to mark. For those of you that are here that are wondering about church, I want to invite you to say, hey, tonight I'm going to pursue being in. I want to take steps forward with Branch Life Church and I want to be a part of the church. I want to be regular and I want to be connected. If that's you, I want to just encourage you in this moment to let us know that you want to be connected. Make sure we have the card and make sure you sign up for the, 
next step of a meal. God, for those that are here that need a church, Lord, I pray that you would lead them to a Bible-believing church that preaches the gospel and that reaches the lost, that cares about the community around it. And Lord, I pray that you would lead some of those here to branch. And God, that we would, we would be able to team together and be stronger together as one body going after your mission to be the light of the world. God, we thank you for this time that we have together. Help us to always be a, a place that cares for our neighbor. We dedicate that to you. God, use us. Help us to see and meet needs on a regular basis. In your precious holy name we pray. Amen.